Wordsworth's ode, Intimations of Immortality, presents many Wordsworthian ideas that should be very recognizable to us by now. Uh, Wordsworth's sense of something that has been lost in the passage from childhood to adulthood, and his simultaneously, simultaneous movement towards insisting that he has been amply repaid for what has been lost uh, is a pattern that we should recognize from Tintern Abbey in particular, uh, at the Prelude, and, and even some of his other poems. Uh, Wordsworth wrote the first four stanzas of this poem in 1802 and then added the last seven in 1804. So let's start by just looking at those first four stanzas in isolation. <clears throat> the first two stanzas celebrate a past when the earth and every common sight uh, seem to radiate the glory and the freshness of a dream. Uh, this might almost make us think of the state of Blakeian innocence, uh, this, this very idealized uh, sense of childhood. But then the next two stanzas play out a tension between moments of ecstasy and awareness of those moments slipping away. <clears throat> For example, um, while the birds thus sing a joyous song, and while the young lambs bound as to the tabor's sound, to me alone there comes a thought. There came a thought of grief. Uh, it is only the speaker that experiences grief in the midst of the joys of nature. Uh, his capacity for self-reflection is is preventing him from simply sharing unreflectively in, in those joys as he could do as a child. And again, much of this poem recalls Tintern Abbey. Uh, here we have a clear differentiation between Wordsworth's earlier state, uh, in which he was capable of an unreflective appreciation of nature, and his later condition in which he values nature for the, the feeling of connectedness it provides and its poetic inspiration. And again, we might think of Blake here and his concepts of innocence and experience. Wordsworth passes through an unreflective state of innocence uh, to get to, uh, to a, a, a state of experience, which he still claims is, uh, is more valuable than the innocence that he's left behind. Uh, we might wonder what Wordsworth means by a timely utterance in stanza three. Uh, is it this poem that he's writing right now, uh, which he has not yet written uh, in terms of the, the, um, where that, that uh, line comes? Um, or is it some other poem that he wrote? Or is it not a poem at all, but a literal utterance? Uh, the diction here is rather vague. It's as if he's trying not to say too much about his own personal experience uh, and to insist on the wider universal relevance uh, of, of that experience. Moreover, the effects of this utterance don't seem to last, as the grief he describes simply returns in the next stanza. The fourth stanza concludes with the crucial question, whither is fled the visionary gleam where is it now the glory and the dream uh, and we might ask what would be the effect if the poem ended here as it did in 1802 uh, where when wordsworth wrote just the first four stanzas is this a despairing question or one that already looks ahead to its answer um, it almost seems as if Wordsworth takes it for granted that there is a good answer to this question, the, the abundant recompense that we talked about with Tintern Abbey. Uh, you'll notice also that your, your text in the, the uh, note, uh, the prefatory note in your textbook, uh, Wordsworth says, nothing was more difficult for me in childhood than to admit the notion of death as a state applicable to my own being. Um, in other words, Wordsworth was the child from We Are Seven, uh, who is, is unable to understand death. Uh, and we can see this attitude resurfacing in, in this poem, albeit in a somewhat more sophisticated formulation. 
stanza five rejoins the debate and starts the turn towards a more vigorous affirmation. The glory and the dream are not gone. They've simply become less visible to our worldly eyes. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. Uh, this is a perspective that Wordsworth draws from Plato, a belief that the soul pre-exists the body in some idealized worldly state. Not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Uh, the argument here is that uh, we retain some of the luster of that spiritual state when we enter the world. Uh, and this leads Wordsworth back to another of his favorite subjects, the idealization of the state of childhood. He goes on to refer to child's play as some fragment from his dream of human life. Uh, the child is represented as being fundamentally imitative. Uh, he, the speaker points out how children rush to take part in the adult world, which nevertheless robs them of their innocent apprehension of it. The little actor cons another part, filling from time to time his humorous stage. Um, the, the, this theatrical metaphor works to, to give a sense of human life as fundamentally illusory. Wordsworth is casting life as uh, a role that is being played rather than, uh, than an essential quality. Uh, which thus enables him to to make that platonic argument that what is uh, what is real is uh, what is beyond the veil of life. Uh, Wordsworth goes on to uh, further idealize the child as thou best philosopher, mighty prophet, seer blessed. And again, uh, this is characteristic of Wordsworth in its idealization, but we also might wonder if he's getting a little carried away here. Uh, Coleridge would later devote a whole chapter of his Biographia Literaria to the defects of Wordsworth's poetry, uh, on what, one of which he is what he calls mental bombast. Uh, and he, he says in this chapter, uh, in what sense is the child of that age a philosopher? In what sense does he read the eternal deep? In what sense is he declared to be forever haunted by the supreme being? Or so inspired as to deserve the splendid titles of a mighty prophet, a blessed seer? By reflection, by knowledge, by conscious intuition, or by any form of modification of consciousness? In other words, Coleridge is calling Wordsworth out on this this rather hyperbolic praise of the child, which, uh, when you dig deep into it, is uh, from Coleridge's point of view uh, pretty meaningless. Wordsworth goes on to give thanks uh, uh, for. These, those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things, fallings from us, vanishings, blank misgivings of a creature. Uh, and this is kind of the crux of the poem. Why is he thankful for these things? Um, he refers to them as shadowy re re recollections, which are yet a master light of, our, of all our seeing, uh, which recalls the sensory imagery that revolves around light throughout this poem, as well as, uh, as Plato's uh, um, parable of the cave, which uh, again suggests that, that uh, life on earth is shadow uh, rather than, than a, an access to the, the pure light. Uh, and in this poem introduces the paradox that, that, that this, this light is pr produced precisely through that state of shadow. Uh, so as appealing as all the light imagery is, our lives are typically lived in shadow, the poem suggests, and this is where we must draw our light from. 
Uh, and again, he's voicing a philosophy very much akin to the, the spots of time that we talked about in the prelude. Uh, there are moments that uphold us, cherish us, and make our noisy years seem moments in the being of eter the eternal silence. Uh, these moments for Wordsworth are restorative because they put us back in touch with our origins outside of the world. Uh, again, this seems to be why he idealizes the traumatic moments of memory in that they function to remind him of the, the unimportance of mortal life. The poem then concludes with the, the typically words worthy in affirmation. Uh, the, though nothing can bring back the hour of, uh, uh, of splendor in the, in the grass, of glory in the flower, uh, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind. Again, a strong echo of Tintern Abbey and its insistence on abundant recompense for what has been lost. Uh, but again, we can ask, how convincing is this? Wouldn't we rather have splendor in the grass and glory in the flower? Uh, these images take part in the strong pattern of imagery, again, based around light and vision, from the visionary gleam of stanza four uh, and the single word glory that occurs at least four times in the poem, um, signifying an intense visual experience. Then the very end of the poem uh, is, the, the, to me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. And we might also ask what this line means. What is too deep for tears? Is it something that is too sad to even cry about? Something too profound to express through human emotion? Uh, does this suggest that the, the poem is finally returning to the sublime as the source of value for human experience? The visual glory of things we can see is replaced by something that is beyond the human senses? Uh, and we all might also ask about the poet's role in relation to this subject matter. He is the one who remembers the act of forgetting immortality. The consciousness of loss uh, is what in this poem seems to define the role of the poet, uh, what the, the poet has that everyday people do not have. So the poem goes through the same pattern of loss and affirmation we saw in Tintern Abbey, uh, but to close with a thought with a few thoughts on how the odes form produces that effect uh, notice that here we have an, an irregular ode that very much mimics the flux and reflux of the poet's thought uh, his his ideas are not constrained to a particular uh, stanza pattern or rhyme scheme Moreover, the ode in general is con a form that is conventionally more irregular than some of the other forms we've looked at. Uh, and Wordsworth stanzas seem to go back and forth between a more sing-song kind of rhythm and a more restrained blank verse. Uh, and this allows him to, to express the movement from joyfulness to seriousness within the verse itself. Uh, for example, the, the, in the last two stanzas, uh, the, notice the rhythm of lines 180 to 188, uh, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find strength in what remains behind, in the primal sympathy which having been must ever be in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering, in the faith that looks through death. And compare that with the final lines of the poem. The clouds that gather round the setting sun do take a sober coloring from an eye that hath kept watch o'er man's mortality. Another race hath been, and other palms are one, thanks to the human heart by which we live, thanks to its tenderness, its joys and fears, to me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. Ultimately, then, the poem is not a dirge about what Wordsworth has lost, but his attempt to convince us of how much has been gained uh, in spite of this loss.